A reading from the book, the second book of Samuel. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out into battle, David sent Joab with his officers and all Israel with him. They ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David rose from his couch and was walking about on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. David sent someone to inquire about the woman. It was reported, this is Bathsheba, daughter of Elam and wife of Uriah the Hittite. So David sent messengers to get her and she came to him and he lay with her. Now she was purifying herself after her period. Then she returned to her house. The woman conceived and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab and the people fared and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. Uriah went out of the king's house and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the entrance of the king's house with all the servants of the Lord and did not go down to his house. When, the, <clears throat> when they told David, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, you have just come from a journey. Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah remain in booths, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to Uriah, remain here today also and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day. On the next day, David invited him to eat and drink in his presence and made him drunk. And in the evening, he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, set Uriah, in the forefront of the hardest fighting and then draw back from him so that he may be struck down and die. The word of the Lord. The Lord looks down from heaven upon us all to see if there is any who is wise, if there is one who seeks after God. Everyone has proved faithless, all alike have turned bad. There is none who does good, no, not one. Have they no knowledge, all those evildoers, who eat up my people like bread, and who do call upon the Lord? See how they tremble with fear, because God is in the company of the righteous. Their aim is to confound the plans of the afflicted, but the Lord is their refuge. Oh, that Israel's deliverance would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, Jacob will rejoice and Israel be glad. A reading from Letter to the Ephesians. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. 
I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. As you are being rooted and grounded in love, I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get even a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, Gather up the fragments left over, so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, This is indeed the prophet who came into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and to take him by force to make him their king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When the evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to, the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land toward which it was going. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Grace to you and peace. Please be seated. Again, good morning. Good to see you all today. I interesting note on it. A while back, I, I was able to attend a conference, our clergy conference, and uh, one of my favorite theologians was there. I've spoken of him before. You may have heard of him. His name is Walter Brueggemann, right. Uh, he, he, he was challenging us as preachers to not read the Bible through the same lens always, but to consider it through other uh, hermeneutics. It's just a way of looking at something through other avenues, if, if you will. He said, try reading the Bible um, as if it's speaking politically or economically or y y you name it. So to read this morning's gospel and to hear the people 
want to make Jesus their king, though they're not quite ready for that, and Jesus knows this, is to, and to take sort of a political, economic view of it, of course they would want to make Jesus their king. All they've ever known from kings for all of their history is someone who would exploit them and take from them, never someone who would actually feed them and heal them. So you can see from this morning's gospel why there's such a roar to have Jesus, at least it seems that way in my mind, to have a roar, the roar to have Jesus become king because he's the best thing they've ever known. So, and then it says Jesus left and went up on the mountain to pray. Again, we're not just ready, it seems, to have Jesus as our king yet just because we've been fed, huh? I am uh, deeply into the letter to the Ephesians the, these days. I commend it to you. I, I know scripture can be difficult to just pick up and start in places, but if you ever wanted a good place to start first and sec the first and second chapters of the letter to the Ephesians, attributed to Paul, but we don't know who wrote it. Um, uh, is Paul out enough for me? We'll call it Paul. Uh, the first and second chapters of the letter to the Ephesians are, are transcendent. Uh, if not just beautiful, and, and, and to read them and to read them slowly and thoughtfully and, and reflect on them and reflect on what is the main message of the letter, which is the love of God. And not just the love of God in some broad abstract way, but the love of God as seen in the work, the sacrifice, the death, the blood of Jesus Christ for you, which is what he's trying to drive home to the Gentiles. Jesus died not just for the Jews, but for you. As you recall from last week, you who were far off. Outside, it seems, the realm of salvation. It is the writer's intent through his words to bring the people who, who read this letter to, to know to comprehend the breadth, the length, the height, the depth of, of God's, God's love for them, for us. I, I, I'm struck that many of us, I'll say it this way, most of us do not begin our knowledge of the breadth, the length, the height, and depth of God's love uh, just, just by praising him it, it occurs to me that many of us, if not most of us, sort of back our way into the love of God through avenues that we would not have chosen. I am reading right now a, a, a book, a very, very old book, a uh, book written in the, not as old as the Bible, but old enough, a book written in the 17th century by a Japanese samurai warrior, a guy named Miyamoto Musashi. Say it. Mayamoto Musashi. I love it. Mayamoto Musashi, when he was 13 years old, he was set to challenge another warrior, a warrior of a different school of training, and he defeated him. All these duels, by the way, were to the death. He defeated from the time he was 13 years old until the time he was almost 30, 29 years old, he defeated 60 great warriors it seems as though, at least the, book, the way the book reads, he himself, Musashi, had never had any formal training in, war, in being a warrior. He claims that this, his ability to be successful in battle was just something that he innately knew. It must have been natural to him. And he attributed his knowledge, though through no training of this thing, he attributed it to just strategy and to free thinking uh, almost. It's almost as if he was, he was a better warrior because his timing was different because he had not been formally trained. W wonderful little book. It's called The Book of Five Rings. It was written in, in, in the early 17th century. The Book of Five Rings. It is a book of strategy. It's a wonderful little book. It, it reads like something Confucius would write. Every now and then it'll go a few words, a paragraph or two, and then it'll say, you would do well to reflect on these things. Read a few more lines, 
You should think about this. Read a few more lines. It takes much practice and sacrifice. It sounds very scriptural, does it not? I love it. One of the things he says in this book over and over again is no one thing, no 10,000 things. No one thing, no 10,000 things. As if to say, You can't know it all, but if you know one thing, you can back into the knowledge of everything else. As if there's a key to knowledge that begins with knowing one thing. And the one thing is never, ever described. Much like the life of faith, you know one thing and you begin to back in so many others. For instance, forgiveness. To know what it is like to be forgiven, to experience forgiveness that only comes through love, is to not only know forgiveness, but to understand compassion, to begin to know love, to understand something about peace. You see where I'm going, right? To know one thing is to know 10,000 things. The story of David and Bathsheba is a well-known one. Everybody here knows that story. David, a king who was chosen at a very early age, the greatest king of Israel, chosen at an early age to rule them, blessed in every way one could imagine. I guess this story, for lack of a better synopsis, I guess this story is a story of how the greatest king of Israel, even he, was a sinful man. Greatest king, even he, a sinful man. David, who had everything, seemingly even had a strong faith, but yet probably, certainly, did not know, know, comprehend the breadth, the length, the height, the depth of God's love for him. It would take him not having everything that was intended him, intended for him. It would take him risking it all and becoming a murderer because of a woman, no less. I don't mean that. Badly, I'm just saying that's the way the story goes. (laughs) It would take him risking it it all um, because of his lust for Bathsheba. It would take the knowledge of himself as a murderer for him to fully understand who, who God is. He backed into love, if you will. Now we'll hear more about this next week, but I've got so much to say about it, I thought I'd get a head start on it. We'll see, we'll hear more about this next week in, in, in when we hear Nathan's parable. So that is a teaser for next week. I expect to see you here to hear Nathan's parable anyway. There's a wonderful song, I, and, and, it, and it's, I, this song has been on my mind for, for the last few days, and I can't, I can't get it out of my head. The song, Hallelujah, written, written by Leonard Cohen. You know this song, do you, do you not? I heard, there is a secret chord, David played and it pleased the Lord, but you don't really care for music, do you? It goes like this, the fourth, the fifth, the minor fall, the major lift. You know this? Yeah. It's a beautiful song. Second verse of that song goes... (laughs) Your faith was strong, but you needed proof. You saw her bathing on the roof. Her beauty and the moonlight overthrew you. Overthrew you. Love is not a victory march. It is a cold and a broken hallelujah. To know God's love is to not to seek it, 
not to try to find it through path or journey, not to try to praise our way to it, although I would suggest it's a good place to start. The way we come to know the one thing is through our fallenness and our brokenness. The only way any of us will ever say or sing or declare hallelujah beautifully is to back into God's love through an avenue that we probably would not have chosen through our own sinfulness, through our own weaknesses, and to back into God's love and to experience one thing, anything, forgiveness, peace, compassion, the desire to love God back, which is perhaps the height of the spiritual Christian life of faith. No one thing. No 10,000 things. Amen. We believe in one God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In the course of the silences that follow each bidding in our prayers, we invite you to offer your own prayers, either silently or aloud. Let us pray. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for the Archbishop Justin Welby, our presiding bishop, Catherine Jefford Shorey, presiding bishop-elect, Michael Curry, and our bishop, Rob O'Neill, for this gathering and for all ministers and people. Pray for the church. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. Pray for those in any need or trouble. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of him. Pray that they may find and be found by him.
I ask your prayers for the departed, remembering today Myra Miller, the grandmother of Nancy Palazzi. Pray for those who have died. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. We pray for the marriage of Tyler and Candy, and we pray for members of the U.S. Armed Forces and their families, especially Walter, Glenn, Nick, Doug, Michael, Alex, Mary, and Micah. In peace we pray to you, Lord God, remembering today the Anglican Church of Quebec, Canada, and their bishop. And we pray for the churches of Colorado, especially Intercession Church in Thornton, Peace in Christ Episcopal Lutheran Ministry in Elizabeth, St. Albans Church in Windsor, St. Andrew Church in Lahana, St. Paul's Church in Mancos, and Bridget's Bounty Community Resources in Frederick. Please join me in affirming our vision statement. The mission of St. Paul's Episcopal Church is to live out the love of God as seen in Jesus Christ. We will, with God's help, discover God's presence in word and sacrament, share God's word, nurture God's people, encourage congregational and personal growth on our shared journey, and act justly and peaceably. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone, and so uphold us by your Spirit, that we may live and serve you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May Almighty God grant us forgiveness of all our sins and the grace and comfort of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you.